teeth wax early down the street with the brim pulled way down low. Ain't no sound but the sound of his feet. Machine guns ready to go. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Are you hanging on the edge of your seat? Out of the doorway, the bullets rip down to the sound of the beat. Say there, stranger. Remember me? I'm the stranger who stalks your sanity. Now, the time has come for you and I to consider if self-love is the moral core of the adult child. And if it is, how is it so? To begin, I remind you that the way I am unfolding the program of the Great Recovery involves a number of interweaving factors, stating the basic principles of the movement, stating, defining the basic insights, which I am going to call insights, and as well, eventually, maybe, there will be incentives that is to say, actions to undertake consistent with being part of the great recovery. It's important to know that recovery was not a recruiting movement. One never recruited anyone else to the movement. The catchphrase was, it grows by attraction rather than promotion. And I would like to see the great recovery go in the same manner. Now, brace yourself, because I'm warning you that what I have to say about self-love belongs to a heavy category of human philosophy and reflection, self-reflection. The self-reflection of the human animal through the ages has produced various genres, namely philosophy. Uh, psychology, and so forth. And the genre that applies here is moral ideology. So when I say that self-love is the moral core of the adult child, that is a proposition of moral ideology. And it is one of several, not many, maybe four or five essential propositions that provide the building blocks for the great recovery. Another one is racial ideology. So both moral and racial ideology are inherent to this program, if you want to call it a program. Am I programming you? Uh, I wish not. My intention, as you know by now, is to educate you. Education means literally, literally to draw forth what is innate. And the difference between educating the public and programming the public is that genuine education is always open and transparent, completely open and transparent, whereas programming always requires that the programmers pretend to do something other than the, what they are actually doing. They hide their motives. So that's the difference. You know my motives. I'm open and transparent about the way that I deliver. So there. Now it's fair to say that the genre of moral ideology interfaces in some respect with the realm of belief. So I put to you this question. Do you believe that self-love is innate to the human animal. Do you believe that you innately possess self-love? It is, is it something you are born with or do you in some way acquire it in the course of life? Such is the leading question. There have been, of course, many debates about this issue through history, especially let's just say in the Western world in Western culture and civilization. If you went to look elsewhere, such as ancient China, modern China, 
or if you went to the Aboriginal culture of Australia or to the cultures of the many tribes of the Native Americans, you would find that there are different beliefs about the innateness of self-love. However, interestingly, you will find that in those uh, discussions, such as Rousseau, Rousseau's famous proposition in the Enlightenment about the noble savage and the assumption of the essential goodness of human nature, that the debates use the term essential goodness and not the term self-love. And I defy you to go into any uh, text or any philosophical discussion regarding the essential components of human nature and find the word self-love included. It is not included. The inclusion of self-love into these discussions right now, right here, is an outstanding mark of the great recovery. You and I are really trailblazing a new view of human nature by including the factor of self-love in the discussions of what is innate to human nature. I understand, I picked up on a few videos from supposed uh, elders of Native American tribes, I think particularly a Navajo, and he stated that the Navajo believe that human animals are essentially evil. So there are many different beliefs about the innate properties, the innate attributes of the human species. I can tell you out front that I believe, take it as a proposition of belief, that self-love is innate to the human animal. And I also believe that the capacity for goodness in the human animal is linked or geared to self-love. Hence, you cannot fully, adequately, or accurately discuss the one without discussing the other. It's worth repeating that those who entered those rooms back in the 90s at the peak of the recovery movement in the United States relied strongly on a single text, The Drama of the Gifted Child by Alice Miller. And this text contains a proposition of moral ideology framed in psychological terms. Let me reprise for you exactly what Alice Miller said. She said that the capacity for self-love is innate in every human child from the moment of birth, the capacity. Bear in mind that a capacity is not an ability and an ability is not a skill. You may have the capacity to play music, but it's only a capacity, it's potential. If you have the ability to play music, then you have developed that capacity. And if you have skill, then you have, you have advanced the ability. So given that syntax, I say that self-love is an innate capacity, which begs the question, how does that capacity become an ability? How does it unfold into an ability? And then in turn, how does it unfold into skill? Do you have the skills that derive uniquely from innate self-love or not? What Alice Miller said is that children grow up to be dysfunctional and narcissistically deprived, that is her term, when the capacity for self-love in the infant child before speech is not activated, passive voice. That happens when some adult, not necessarily the mother, in the environment of the newborn child up to the age of two or three, does not activate it. So it's there, but it has to be activated. And how is it activated? Well, Alice Miller uniquely said, it's activated through the gaze, through looking. 
She said that an adult, not necessarily the mother, and by the way, she demolished the myth of mother love. Alice Miller insisted that a mother, as the biological parent of a child, does not automatically love the child. Child Love between parent and child is not a biological imperative. It is a moral imperative. So what she said was that if the child has the good fortune to encounter an adult, I'm talking about the child that can just talk and walk, just barely at that threshold, who has innate self-love already, then that adult, as a witness, looking with its eyes into the eyes of the child, will activate the innate self-love of the child. Now, I hold this to be a paramount proposition of the adult child movement. It certainly hit me right between the eyes and woke me up to many, many things. And I can recall that I did not know, receive the triggering gaze of self-love from my biological mother, nor from my stepfather. But I do remember those adults who conferred it upon me. And I remember them and will always remember and respect them and be grateful to them for doing that. I'm not going into biographical detail about how that happened for me, but I will address an important consideration that might have crossed your mind. Well, what are you saying, John? If the triggering gaze does not activate the innate capacity for self-love in a child in that critical period of infancy, up until the age of three or four, then what? Well, optimally, it could happen then. Optimally, it should happen in those first three or so years. However, that's not how it happened with me at all. It happened with me in two phases. When I got to a more advanced stage of my life, that is, the teenage years, I met certain people who were my teachers and people that I encountered who were adults who were not part of my family circle. And from them, even at that age, say 14, 15, 16, I received a glimmer, an in inceptive glimmer of the activation of self-love that I ought to have achieved much earlier. So you're not finished, you're not done and dusted, you're not cooked if you don't get it in those first three years, and many people don't. And I am really fortunate that I received a, an inflection of the triggering gaze of self-love in my teens. It steadied me. And it helped me enormously, but it was far from what I needed to fully recover. And it was not until I entered the recovery movement and learned this principle that I got what I had been missing since infancy. And this is how I got it. I remember clearly the day, a few weeks into attending ACA meetings, when I drove from Santa Fe out to a place called Shidoni, which was an estate. Actually, it was. It used to be an Indian burial ground. But it had been turned into an artistic area. So there was a foundry there, and painters and artists and sculptures gathered there, and there were exhibits. And I was driving out to Shidoni, my car, and I started to sob. And I realized just after attending meetings in those rooms for a few weeks, that, let me say it exactly, I could finally own my capacity for self-love due to the recognition of being loved. And who loved me? Who supported me and brought me to that recognition? Strangers. 
people that I didn't even know, people who sat with me anonymously in those rooms. Now, if you reflect on that little proposition and go back and review it and savor those exact words, you will see that there is a universal message in that. And the message is, the implication is, that if you do not own your innate capacity to self, for self-love, you cannot genuinely either love anyone else or accept being loved by them. But there's an ironic twist because it's through the loving gaze of others that you do own and activate your innate self-love. It's a precarious proposition. So anyone you meet can, who has their innate self-love up and running by looking at you, just looking at you, can activate the same in you. This is a beautiful proposition. It's tender, it's precarious, and it is also brutally correct and brutally strong. It is like a brutal law of survival for the human animal as much as any law of survival you see enacted by species out there in the prey predator theater of nature. So far, so good, perhaps. Now, I'm, in closing, I'm going to hit you with another powerful proposition. Why is self-love the moral core of the human animal? What do I mean by that statement? What I intend to get across to you there is that there is a, a living, palpitating, protoplasmic core of your physical existence at whatever age you live. You might be 16, you might be 26, you might be 76. And in all those cases, the child that you were still lives. You are not simply an adult who became a child. You are a child who is perpetually becoming an adult. And if the conditions for the child are not met, the initial conditions in the early years, then the way in which you will develop, the way in which that child you still are, develops into an adult will be lopsided, erratic, inadequate, dysfunctional, damaged, and possibly even self-destructive. Everything depends on the integrity of your core as a living animal. And what is at the center of that core is the moral power of a human animal, the power to act morally. We tend to think of morals as definitions or rules of obedience. Some people still think that the Ten Commandments is a set of morals. It's not a set of morals at all. It's, it's rules of obedience dictated by bearded men who pretend to be speaking in behalf of an off-planet father God. Moral autonomy, which is the goal of recovery, to be a sovereign, self-intending person has nothing to do with obedience to rules. So one of the main reasons why people still adhere to religious dogmas, whether they be Judaic, Christian, Islamic, whatever, is that they operate under the illusion that human beings can only be good by obeying rules about how to be good. But I say, no, no, no. I say human beings, if they act for the good, if they express goodness, kindness, genuine care, empathy, they do it out of the moral core of their own being. They do not do it because they are following rules. Now, it's important to, uh, to state and to discuss the principles of moral ideology. Very important subject. I've created a new word for that. On Nemeta, there's an entire course in called 
ideosophy, but never make the mistake that these discussions enable you to be moral, to act as a good person. What enables you to do that is your moral core. It is the protoplasm of the living child in you. You are not an adult who used to be a child. You are a child who continues to be an adult. That is a fundamental proposition of the great recovery and of the recovery movement founded on the work of Alice Miller and others. Now, I have some things to say in the next talk, complementary to this one, about the stages of emergence of the core self in the child, the living biological protoplasmic entity of the child. In doing so, I can outline five clear stages or phases of emergence of the moral core of who you are. And I maintain strongly that knowing those five stages is uh, essential. It's essential education, primary education for participation in the great recovery. So that's it. And remember, as always, the invitation is open to meet me in the beauty that kills.